If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I uh, am so grateful for the time we had together last week as a, uh, as a faith family as we fasted and prayed together. I've heard from a variety of you just about how meaningful, how, how powerful that, that time was for you. I was... I was having lunch on Monday. I was breaking my fast and lunch with five brothers and sisters from Kenya who were here in our worship gathering last Sunday and are part of Compassion in Kenya. They grew up in abject poverty and uh, are now graduating from college and influencing their cultures and providing for their families. Just incredible stories. And... We were talking about different things, and they asked me at one point, they said, uh, well, is that, is that something you all do often? Do you all fast together often like that? And I said, well, actually, no, that was the first time we've done that. Um, I imagine for some people it was their first time to ever fast, and so this was something we need to do more, and we were going to do more. And so I just asked them, I said, well, like, do, you, do you guys fast together like that very much? And it was this awkward pause at the table. And then one of them spoke up and said, well, uh, in our church, uh, we start every year with a 28-day fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I'll take that as a yes. Like, uh, yeah, well, we're going to do that like next, but we were starting with one day and, and then clearly by January we'll be ready for 28. Uh, yeah, so anyway, anybody else got anything they want to talk about? Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to do, do that some more in the days to come. Obviously, I did not preach last week, and I am clearly making up for lost time in what you have in front of you with a, count them, 15-point sermon with a variety of uh, sub-points and sub-sub-points. So I had one person come up to me last week and say, Pastor, just want you to know that was the best sermon you've ever preached. And... Uh, <laughs> So I can take it. Uh, in all seriousness, when I, when I saw where our Bible, we, our Bible reading was going to be this week in 1 Chronicles 29, and the emphasis in this text is on giving, and it's a picture of the people of God giving. And my mind immediately went to some of the things that a few weeks ago I had taught for six or seven hours on at Secret Church when it comes to giving. And there were some things. Now, Secret Church has, has become this thing where a lot of people come in from out of town and take up all the seats in here. And so there's, there's probably a majority of our faith family that's not at Secret Church. And there were some things in my study looking at the gospel and possessions and prosperity that I thought as soon as I have an opportunity, these are things that I don't just want to teach at Secret Church. These are things we need to look at as a faith family. Uh, some important things, even some things that my mind uh, has shifted on, been transformed a bit in uh, as a result of that study. And so what I want to do this morning is I want us to look at First Chronicles 29. I want us to see this picture of giving at this part in redemptive history, and then let it lead us into thinking about giving an overall redemptive history. And I want us to dive into some of those things that I think are important for us to dive into as a church when it comes to our giving. And so we're going to read First Chronicles 29, we're going to see this story, and then we're going let it, to let it drive us, lead us into seeing where we are as the people of God in 2010 fitting into giving an overall redemptive history. So let's start with 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1. And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and in inexperienced, and the work is great. For the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, besides great quantity of, quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marbles. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, 
and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of fathers' houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehiel, the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have, given, have we given you. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, Keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts towards you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may give your commandments, keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And on the next day offered burnt offerings to the Lord. One thousand bulls, one thousand rams, and one thousand lambs. With their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. Let's pray. Father, we know that we are a wealthy people in this room. particularly compared to the rest of the world and our brothers and sisters in the rest of the world. We praise you for food that is available to us today, for water that is available to us today, for shelter over us, for clothes on our back, We take none of these things for granted. We thank you for them and the abundance of resources you have given us beyond these things. And we pray today, particularly amidst a materialistic culture, that by your Spirit, through your Word, you would change our minds and our hearts to be one with yours, that you would make us and mold us into a people who give to your glory. We want to be faithful in redemptive history, to give in a way that honors and glorifies you. And so we pray that you would teach us today, transform our hearts 
that we might give with our whole hearts willingly, just as we see here, even greater ways than we see here, based on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Three reflections on Old Covenant giving. That's where we're going to start. And this, this picture, what you see at the very beginning of First Chronicles 29 is David giving his gifts. And then you see the people giving. And these are massive gifts. When you get to verse 7, it says they gave 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold and 10,000 talents of silver and so on. Talents and derricks, these are not measurements that are familiar to us. And there's even some debate over all this means, but most estimate this is like 190 tons of, of gold, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, 3,750 tons of iron. We're talking about literally millions of pounds of gold and silver and bronze and iron and other things that were given on this day. Like this was a good offering day. It's a strong Sunday right here when they gave millions of pounds of all the stuff. And what I want you to see, what I love about this passage is how David responds to such extravagant giving. He doesn't say, look at how great the people are or great the gifts are. Instead, his response is to turn his face toward heaven to bless the Lord and say, look at how great God is. You see this. First reflection on Old Covenant giving. Giving is God-driven, God-centered, and God-exalting. Giving is God-driven, God-centered, God-exalting. Verse 10, he prays, Blessed are you, Lord. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. One author said David just ransacked the theological dictionary to attribute different characteristics and titles to God. The whole picture is he is glorifying God through the people's giving. Here's a couple of truths here that I want you to see that are coming out in David's prayer that are huge. First, and you got this in your notes, in his prayer, David is showing us that God is the owner of all things and we are his stewards. God's the owner of all things. We are his stewards. Look at verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the victory. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. Verse 12. Riches and honor come from you. In your hand are power and might. Verse 14. Who am I? What is my people that we should be able to thus offer willingly? For all things come from you. And of your own have we given you. Catch that. What he's saying is everything we've given belongs to you anyway. God is the owner of all things. This is the glaring reality of Scripture. God owns your house and your car and your TV and your clothes. And for that matter, God owns you. God owns your wallet and everything in it. He owns your bank account and everything in it. And so anything we give is simply giving to him what he already owns. Now, it's like if you have a nice car and you give it to me to drive around for a couple of days and I bring it back to you and I say, out of the depth of my heart, and generosity, I want to give you this car. You would look at me and (laughs) at least think, if not say, thank you for your humble generosity, but it's mine anyway. The reality is, anything we give to God, He already owns. We are stewards of it. Another way to put this in your notes, God is the giver of all things and we are his servants. What this means is because God gave it, God has the authority to say what to do with it. We are not masters with our money. We are servants with our money. 
just as Jesus is Lord over every decision we make, we realize this, church, we have lost the right to determine the direction of our lives. Jesus directs our paths. Jesus directs every decision we make, and not just every decision we make, Jesus determines every dollar we spend. We are not in control of our spending. God is in control of our spending. He leads. He guides. He says this is what to do with it. He's the owner. He's the giver. We are stewards. We are servants. That's the whole picture. What David is praying here when he talks about how it all belongs to God and everything they give is only coming from God and they're giving because their hearts were driven by God to give. Giving is God-driven, God-centered, and God-exalting. Second reflection. God's people give out of celebration, not out of obligation. Verse 9. The people rejoiced because they had given willingly. They had offered freely to the Lord. Verse 17, I know, O God, that you test the heart. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. Now I've seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously. You get to the end in verse 22, they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. The picture here is, it's what we see in 2 Corinthians 8 in the New Testament, but it's here in the Old Testament. God loves cheerful givers. God creates cheerful givers. God compels cheerful givers. This is not, people say, well, Old Testament giving was just obligatory. It was law-driven. Does this look like obligation? This is celebration. This is joyful celebration and giving. Second reflection, God's people give out of celebration, not out of obligation. Then third reflection, our giving is always attached to our hearts. In verse 9, when David talked about how they gave willingly, he says, with a whole heart they offered freely to the Lord. When you go back up to verse 5, you see David give the invitation. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? That language literally means who will devote their hearts to the Lord. And what we're seeing is that generous giving is the overflow of a God-centered heart. That heart is attached to our giving. This is what we see in New Testament too, isn't it? Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our heart and our money always go together. Where our money is shows where our heart is. That's a humbling truth, isn't it? Where our money is shows where our heart is. Our giving is always attached to our hearts. Now I want you to look with me at verse 6. It says, the leaders of fathers' houses made their free will offerings. I want us to move into the second part in your notes there. Free will offerings. You might underline it or circle it. That's one type of offering in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. What I want to do is I want us to think about the Old Testament now, and I want us to see how this picture, free will offerings, fits into Old Testament gifts altogether. So you've got in your notes three types of Old Testament covenant gifts. We're not going to have time to turn to all these different places. You might just write down little notes that talk about in your notes there where this is found. First type of Old Testament gift was a tithe. Tithes were given. Verse here, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 says, every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. The meaning here of tithe is literally a tenth part, one-tenth, ten percent. That was a tithe. Now the picture here in Leviticus 27.30 is that from the land, from the fruit of the trees, the produce, a tenth is to be given to the Lord. What I want you to see, though, is that there were different tithes, different tenths, so to speak, that we see in the Old Covenant that God's people were to give. First, you got this in your notes, a tithe was given to support the priests and Levites. A tithe was given to support the priests and the Levites. God commanded his people to support the spiritual leaders in the community of faith. To fulfill God's calling in their lives. Numbers chapter 18, verse 21 through 24 talks about a tithe for the priests and the Levites. Numbers 18, 21 through 24. Second, a tithe was given to provide 
for community celebration. There was, a, there was a time when all the people would bring a tithe together and they would celebrate there at the central sanctuary. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 and 23. Tithe was given to provide for community celebration. And then, third, finally, a tithe was given to help the poor and the needy. A tithe was given to help the poor and the needy. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 and 29. Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. Now, this one was a little different. This first tithe was given every year, a tenth to help support the priests and Levites. The second tithe was given every year also to provide for this community celebration. But then there was this third tithe given to help the poor and the needy that was taken every three years. Deuteronomy 14, 28 says at the end of every three years, you bring out all the tithe of your produce. And so the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow shall come and eat and be filled. So this was every three years. So you had a tenth given every year here, a tenth given every year here, and then a tenth given every three years here. You add that up. And what you realize is in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, we think, well, that just means when people tithe in the Old Testament, that means they gave 10% of their income. But the reality is you put these together, and the total tithe every year was about 23% per year. Two tithes, a tenth each, 10%, 10%, 20%, 10%, 10%, 20%, and then one tithe, 10% split out over three years, 3%. About 23% per year. And that's what the people of God were giving. Now, I want to offer a little side note here. Because of the unique nature of Israel, the people of God, they were a, a nation state, and so they were a government. Part of their giving here in the tithes was similar to, not exactly the same, but similar to what we might sometimes give when it comes to taxes. And so that's just a little side note. But the picture here is 23% of their income per year was being, was, was being given like this. And this was just one type of offering, one type of gift in the Old Covenant. So I want us to kind of break out from our thinking that in the Old Testament, tithe just 10% of their income and that was the end of their giving. No. The tithe was actually 23% of their income, and that was, the only, that was the start of their giving. The tithe, you got this in your notes, was only the beginning of their giving. This 23% was not the ceiling of their giving. It was the floor, so to speak. It was where their giving started. In addition, the Israelites gave two other types of Old Covenant gifts. First, fr- first fruit offerings were given to offer the best of the Lord. First fruit offerings, which basically means first off the top, your first and your best from an example of this, Le- Leviticus chapter 19, verse 23 through, 20, th- 23 through 25. Leviticus 19, 23 through 25 talks about giving the first off the top of the production of your vineyard. Exodus chapter 23, verse 16 talks about giving the first off the top of your, your production of uh, wine or grain or oil. Exodus 23, 16. Numbers chapter 15 Verse 20 and 21, Numbers 15, 20 and 21 talks about giving the first off the top of any coarse meal. So these were first fruit offerings. So you had tithes, first fruit offerings, and then third type of Old Covenant gift, free will offerings that were given to offer the excess to the Lord. And that's what we're seeing here in First Chronicles 29. What they're giving here was over and beyond, above and beyond their tithes and their first fruit offerings. This was even more Free will offerings. Now, I've got to show you something here. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 36. You've got, you've got to see this. Exodus chapter 36, verse 3. What I want us to see here is that the tithe was just the starting point. And giving in the Old Testament under the law went so far beyond the tithe. 23% plus first fruit offerings plus, plus free will offerings. And I want you to see a picture. We've seen it already in 1 Chronicles 29, but I love this picture. In Exodus chapter 36, look at this free will offering. This was when God's people had come out of slavery in Egypt. They were about to construct, the, they were working on constructing the tabernacle, and so they needed offerings, free will offerings, to be given to construct the tabernacle. Listen to this Exodus 36, verse 3. They received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings, there it is, every morning, so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, 
the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp, let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Ha! Like they were giving too much. It was necessary to tell the people of God, stop giving. Like, oh, for the day. Like, in the church when we put out the beacon. Like, okay, like, you're too generous. Like, stop. Giving too much. We have more than we need. Like, what a great picture. This is free will offerings. No ceiling on this. Tithe in the Old Covenant, just the floor of giving. It's where it started. And it wasn't just 10%. It was 23%. On top of that, you had first fruit and free will offerings. So that's the picture in the Old Testament. It's where 1 Chronicles 29 fits in. Begs the question, what does this have to do with us then as the people of God in 2010? We are not the Old Covenant people of God. We're in a much different picture here. And we know that when we see commands in the Old Covenant, that we are to look in the New Covenant. And if a command in the Old Covenant is repeated in the New Covenant, then we are to follow it. It is binding upon us. But if a command in the Old Covenant, like we see in all kinds of things, in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, if it is there in the Old Covenant, but it's not reiterated in the New Covenant, then we are not to automatically apply it. And so that begs the question then, and it is a question that is debated all across the board in our Christian culture today, is tithing commanded for New Covenant believers? Should New Covenant believers tithe? And this is where diving in to study for Secret Church was challenging and transforming transforming some of my thoughts on this whole picture. We briskly walked over this about a year ago when we were walking through 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and talking about giving. But I want us to revisit this. Let's move now into new covenant giving. And I want to I put before you three conclusions based on the picture we see in the old covenant and in the new covenant. Number one, here's the deal. There is no command to tithe under the new covenant. There is no command to tithe under the new covenant. Now I want you to hold your place here in 1 Chronicles 29 because we're going to come back here. But go with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Here's the deal. There is only one time in the entire New Testament that tithing is even addressed. I say one time. It's, it's one conversation Jesus had with some religious leaders, and it's recorded by both Matthew and Luke. We're going to look at Luke's account. So technically there's two occurrences, but they're talking about the same situation. One time in the entire New Testament where the tithe is even mentioned, and I want you to see it. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Jesus is talking to religious leaders, the Pharisees. Listen to what he says. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe... There it is. Mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So basically Jesus says, you guys are tithing. Great. You ought to do those things. But you're missing the point. You tithe and then you show the justice and love of God in the way you treat those who are in need around you. If you tithe and you ignore those who are needy around you and you do not show them the justice and love of God, then you're missing the whole point. And so Jesus here does not command tithing. He does imply that they ought to be doing that. But even at this point, some say, well, the reality is, though, Jesus is talking here in a, still in an old covenant framework. He has not gone to the cross, died on the cross for our sins, risen from the grave, sent his spirit, inaugurated the church. It's not where we see this. This is before that even happens. So he's still talking to religious leaders in an old covenant framework. So 
does that mean then that we should throw tithing out the window? Some people say yes. Because it's not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. But it's at this point that I want to be really hesitant to throw it totally out the window. Because what we do see in the rest of the New Testament is very interesting. We do see the things that the tithe provided for in many ways emphasized in the New Testament church, i.e. provision for leaders. We see that talked about throughout Paul's letters. Care for those who are in need. We certainly see that. In fact, that's where we realize when you see the new covenant inaugurated, okay, people believe in Christ for the first time and Acts chapter 2, as they hear the gospel preached for the first time, and they trust in him, they repent and are baptized. The Spirit has come down at Pentecost. And what's the first picture we see? Acts chapter 2, what we see is not people giving the tithe. Instead, they are selling their possessions and giving to one another. And then you get to Acts chapter 4, and it says, Much grace was upon them all, and there was no needy person among them. It's what Deuteronomy 15 in the Old Covenant had longed for. It talked about there should be no poor among you. And then here in Acts 4, there was no needy among them because, listen to this, people, Christians, were selling their houses and their lands and bringing all their resources, sacrificing resources to bring them together to help those who were in need. And so what we realize is, yes, there is no command to tithe under the new covenant. Instead, giving in the new covenant involves greater sacrifice than giving in the old covenant. Not less. Greater sacrifices, not less. And people say, people take like Acts chapter 4 and we say now, New Testament is grace giving. And that's why we need to throw the tithe out because that's law. We're grace givers now. And that's like common throughout this discussion in our culture right now, in the church, in our setting. We're grace givers, not law givers. Well, here's the problem. Like we're holding on to being grace givers, saying we need to disregard the tithe. The only problem is the average North American Christian gives 2.5% of their income to the church. I think that's probably generous. And I hope, I hope that that is not the case in in our faith family. I hope that it would be higher here. But the problem is, we are talking a lot about grace giving. But the reality is, in the law, even if we just took the old covenant and just, just took 10%, And the picture is a people who had the law that were giving four times as much as people who claim that they have grace. And the reality is if we have grace in the person of Christ, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, who was rich and he became poor on our behalf, left his throne in glory to walk a road to a cross to die for our sins and rise from the grave, a people who follow him, who know this grace, will give far more extravagantly than those who had the law alone. And so the picture here is that if we are not giving greater, with greater sacrifice than those in the law, then we have missed the point. Which leads to conclusions number, conclusion number three, and this is what I'm going to unpack some. It needs a lot of unpacking. But what I want to put before you as pastor to people is that tithing is indeed a helpful guideline for giving under the new covenant. But it is not a legalistic mandate. There's so much here. And I want to unpack why I'm saying this In the next part of your notes, you'll see three reasons why tithing is a helpful guideline. But before we get there, I just want to put it on the table here. Not a legalistic mandate. This is not pastors saying to people, we have a command in the New Testament under the New Covenant that we 
called to obey. This is not saying that. But this is pastor to people saying, I think we need to not throw tithing out the window and to let it be a guide for us, a help for us. And put it on the table. My encouragement, based on what we see in all of redemptive history, I'm going to show you why, is that we start our giving, start your giving, with the first 10% to the church. I, I want to like pause right here and give a thousand qualifications. Number one being, I in no way want to sound self-serving in this. I.e., let me drum up some scriptures and get the faith family giving more. Right? What I simply want to do is I want us to see where we stand in redemptive history. And I want us to consider how we can most honor God with our giving. I want you as an individual or as a family to consider how you can most glorify God with your giving. I want us as a faith family, particularly in an incredibly wealthy materialistic culture, I want us to make sure that we go above and beyond looking at how we can glorify God with our giving. And so, start your giving with the first 10% of the church. I'm going to explain this in a, in a minute. This is the floor of giving. It was the floor of giving in the Old Testament. Old Testament saints, it was automatic. They gave their first and their best to the Lord. And I just don't see how New Testament followers of Christ can give anything less than that. How is that possible for anyone transformed by the grace of Christ to give less than what was required of every single, every single saint in the Old Testament, no matter what their income level? It would make no sense for us to give less than that. So that is a starting point. Floor of giving and then expand your giving with greater percentages according to your excess. What I want to say to us, based on what we're seeing in redemptive history, is to start with the tithe, but don't stop, people of God. The people of God before you have not stopped there either. And we have more grace. So let the tithe be the floor and then realize there is no ceiling on giving. To be finished and done with saying, in the church, I'm going to work my way up to 10%. You don't work your way up to the starting point. You start at the starting point, and then you work your way up from there. And you ask God, God, how can I sacrifice and give generously, not out of obligation, but out of celebration of what Christ has done in me? Because a God-centered heart produces generous hands. That we see all throughout Scripture. Three reasons why tithing. It's helpful in New, Test New Covenant giving. This is, these are three reasons why, as pastor, I am putting something before you that is not explicitly commanded in the New Testament. Why do I think it's a helpful guideline? These three reasons. Number one, because tithing honors a biblical principle. Clearly, the Old Testament describes it. This was the pattern for the people of God throughout generations in the Old Testament. And it was serious. And the things, many of the things they were providing for are things that the New Testament does tell us to provide for as well. The care of the poor and the needy or uh, uh, support for leaders in the church. A variety of things that we see in the Old Testament are reiterated in the New Testament there. So the Old Testament describes this. Second, Jesus endorses it. Sure, Jesus doesn't command it, but his words to those religious leaders certainly endorse tithing. You ought to do those things. They don't give the indication that tithing was soon going to be cast out the window. And as we've talked about, what he does lead us to do is give more, not less. So this honors a biblical principle. Old Testament describes, Jesus endorses, and if I could take it a step further, church history illustrates this. Christians have practiced this. Like we're not coming on the scene in the 21st century, especially with all their wealth, and saying, well, we've got new pictures of giving. Like Irenaeus, church father, right after the New Testament, talked about how tithing was the normal practice of the church, the tenth. Augustine, a few hundred years later, talked about the exact same thing. He talked about how 
how the tenth is given, and then in the, in the other nine tenths that we give alms above and beyond from that. Jerome, another church father, said, if anyone shall not do this, pay tithes, he is convicted of defrauding and supplanting God. So for the first few hundred years after the New Testament canon was closed, it was normal, it was considered wise and normal for the New Testament Christians to be tithing. So here's the deal. If for generations throughout God's people in redemptive history in the Old Testament, made this practice important in their spiritual lives, if Jesus endorsed it, and if those first few centuries of believers practiced it, then I think we need to be careful not just to throw it out just like that. This honors a biblical principle. Second, it reinforces, tithing reinforces the truths of God's ownership and our stewardship. Isn't it... We've seen this. This is what God was doing in the tithe. He was teaching them. He was training them to see his ownership in all things. When they would give the first and their best immediately to God, it was reminding them that they didn't own it in the first place. And isn't this, don't we need this? Don't we need to see our paycheck, no matter how big or small it might be, and immediately remind ourselves, discipline ourselves to see, I don't own this. The Lord owns this. I'm a steward of this. Well, how do we keep that mentality? Well, this is exactly what God was doing. This part of what the reason God gave his people the tithe, to remind them of these things. And we need that reminder every single paycheck we get in our culture. That we are not masters with our money. We are servants with our money. And it all belongs to God, no question. And the way we remind ourselves of that, discipline ourselves of that, remember that God owns it and we're stewards, is to give off the top immediately. Third reason why this is a helpful guideline is because tithing helps us in the constant battle with greed and materialism in our hearts. We know we are among the most wealthy people in the entire world. We are in the top tier of world's people for wealth. And we have scriptures that warn us all over the place of the dangers of wealth. There are even points where scripture teaches that it is difficult for someone who is wealthy to even be a Christian at all. Not impossible, but difficult. That's why 1 Timothy 6, Paul says, those who desire to be rich plunge themselves into ruin and destruction. That's just the desire to be rich. And so what does he say later in 1 Timothy 6? He says, command the rich. Now this is command. Command the rich to be rich in good works, to be generous, and to be willing to share. Don't miss it. Giving is the antidote to materialism. That's not in your notes. That's like no extra charge. The antidote to materialism in our culture is giving. And so the picture is tithing helps us guard All of our tendency toward our money and possessions taking over our hearts, we give. Tithing disciplines us, guides us, leads us in that. This is why I would say to every member in this faith family that I think it would be, based on all we see in Scripture, a helpful guideline for you in your life or for you and your family to start your giving with 10% to the church. This is the training wheels of giving. Caleb has a bike with training wheels on it. So this is where it starts. Training wheels. And then work to shed the training wheels and just go way beyond that. I I know that there are different economic levels represented in this room. I know there are different economic struggles that are represented in this room. And I know we want to be blind to those. But the reality is, this is a picture we have seen 
throughout redemptive history, we stand in a line of people for whom God has provided in such a way that they learned along the way to give, to give intentionally, to give consistently, and to give extravagantly to make his glory known. And we need to be careful not to throw aside all, those, all that has gone before us and come on the scene and come up with all kinds of reasons for why we are giving less in our day. We have been given great grace, which leads us to the whole end of this, three prayers for new covenant givers. And that's where I want to bring you back to 1 Chronicles 29, and really 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Here's the deal. We read at the end of 1 Chronicles 29 in verses 18 and 19 what David did is he prayed. He prayed for the people to continue to have hearts. Listen to what he said. He said, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people. And then he said in verse 19, grant to Solomon my son a whole heart. He prayed that their hearts would always want to give like this, be enthralled with God like this. So then we get to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. And what I want you to see is what happens in Solomon's leadership. David dies at the end of 1 Chronicles 29, 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Solomon takes over. And based on this picture, I want to put before you three prayers that I am praying for my own life, family, and for us as a people when it comes to giving and redemptive history. First prayer, God give us hearts that are enthralled with your worship. God, give us hearts that are enthralled with your worship. This is where Solomon's reign starts. It says in verse 1, 2 Chronicles 1, 1, Solomon, Solomon, the son of David, established himself in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. And in the verses to come, he leads the people out to the tent of meeting where the glory of God dwells. And listen to this. Verse 6, Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. This was the first picture in Solomon's reign. It was worship. A thousand burnt offerings. That's a lot of burnt offerings. And the first picture we see is Solomon saying, my heart belongs to you, God. God, give us hearts that are enthralled with your worship. This is where giving starts, brothers and sisters. Before we even talk about this percentage or this or that, we would do practically in our lives The starting point is hearts in this room that are enthralled with the glory of God and enthralled with the worship of God. That want more than anything else in this world, God to be worshipped. Until that's the starting point, all of our talk after that won't make any sense. Extravagant giving won't make any sense because it won't get you ahead in this culture. It won't advance you because it will be denying you and glorifying God. And that's the whole picture of Christianity. What Jesus has called us to. God, give us hearts and thrall with your worship. Second, God, give us minds that are filled with your wisdom. So right after he offers a thousand burnt offerings, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, verse 7, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said to God, verse 8, you have shown great and steadfast love to David my father and have made me king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David my father be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Verse 10, this is what he asked for. You know the story. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? And God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart. And you have not asked possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you. And have not even asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may govern my people over whom I made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. This is our great need. Hearts that are enthralled with the worship of God, minds that are filled with the wisdom of God. We know that we live in a culture where we are surrounded by worldly wisdom, particularly when it comes to how we spend our money. And not just in the culture, but in the church, infiltrated with worldly wisdom on how we spend our money. And we desperately need the discernment of God to know how to handle our checking accounts. Because we hear all around us great financial advice that leads to hoarding, 
storing up bigger barns, getting better stuff. And we've got to be careful. We need the wisdom of God. So God, give us hearts that are enthralled with your worship and minds that are filled with your wisdom. And then flowing from that, let me go ahead and read it. What happens right after this, midway through verse 12, God says, I will then also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who had, had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like. You read the rest of the chapter. He's got 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horse, horsemen. Like That's a lot of chariots and horsemen. And silver and gold became as common as stone. Possessions, riches, and honor. God, give us hearts that are enthralled with your worship, minds that are filled with your wisdom, and then hands. God, give us hands that are generous with your wealth. Your wealth, it belongs to you. Now, here's the deal. Don't put your notes up quite yet, because I want you to keep them out, and I want you to see this with me. I want you to see the progression here. Look at this and realize, brothers and sisters, a proper use of wealth is grounded in God-given wisdom and God-centered worship. A proper use of wealth, say that one more time, a proper use of wealth is grounded in God-given wisdom and God-centered worship. Because the, what we're going to read in the days to come is Solomon lost sight of God-centered worship. And his heart turned away from the Lord, leading him down a road of worldly wisdom that led him to squander and misuse and abuse the wealth that had been entrusted to him. And it all started with his worship. It's what we've talked about over and over again the Old Testament is pointing us to. We all need new hearts. We need hearts that are conquered and captivated by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who though he was rich became poor for our sakes so that we in our poverty might become rich. We need hearts that are captivated by the glory of a Savior who left his throne in glory to die on a cross for our sins so that not so that we could live it up with all the pleasures in this world but so that we could spend our lives for his glory in this world. And when our hearts are captivated with the desire for His glory and we are begging God, pleading God in every single one of our lives and our businesses in this room, our jobs and our families, we're asking God, give us wisdom to give according to Your Word, according to what is best for the advancement of Your gospel and Your glory. God-centered worship leads to, to God-given wisdom leading to generous hands. What if, church at Brook Hills, what if God wanted his gospel spread to every person on this planet and, and his church serving and loving people in incalculable, incalculable sufferings in the world? If God wanted that, maybe, maybe he would entrust great resources to his church. It is exactly what he has done. We have in the church of Jesus Christ far more than enough resources to get this gospel to every people group on the planet. And along the way to love and to care for people who have no food or water. So the question is, will we let the grace of God lead us not to make more excuses for giving less than that which the people of God did before us in the Old Testament? Will we let the grace of God in Christ compel us to sacrifice more? To start, helpful guideline for any one of us to start at a tithe and to Go beyond that. I know that as soon as I say that, there are people who say, I just can't do it. I've recommended before, I did at Secret Church, a great book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity by Randy Alcorn. And I want to share with you a couple of things he writes. I just can't say it better than what he has said. 
And Alcorn wrote, he's talking about objections people have. If I'm going to tithe eventually, I'm going to tithe, I'm going to tithe eventually. I just need to move toward it slowly. He says, I'm often asked, if I haven't been giving at all, won't God understand if I move toward it gradually, starting at 3% or 5%? What if I told you, Alcorn writes, I've had this bad habit of robbing convenience stores, knocking off about a dozen a year. But then I say to you, this year I'm only going to rob a half dozen. Is that better? Well, yes, it's better, but what would you advise me to do? The solution to robbing God is not to start robbing him less, it's to stop robbing him at all. If tithing is God's minimum expectation, can I afford not to tithe? When people tell me, he writes, I can't afford to tithe, I often ask, if your income were reduced by 10%, would you die? They always admit that they wouldn't. Somehow they would manage to get by. That's proof that they really can tithe. The truth is simply they don't want to. An atheist would get, could get by if he gave away 10% of his income. Even if they don't believe in God, people can afford to tithe. How much more should Christians be able to trust God and by faith, step out in obedience and watch him provide. And then he gives three different scenarios real quickly. First scenario, Bill and Donna are in their mid-30s. Bill has steady work, but there's always too much month left at the end of their money. Bill and Donna sincerely intend to put in the offering box whatever's left at the end of the month between house payments, bills, and sticking a little in the savings. There's never anything left. They feel bad, but what can they do when they're out of money? The problem Bill and Donna don't understand first fruits. They should give to the Lord off the top, not about out of what's left or not left. They don't realize that the tithe belongs to God, and there's a word for taking money that doesn't belong to them, stealing. Second situation. Joan's a 22-year-old, just finishing college. Her 30-hour-a-week job pays just over minimum wage. She earns $800 a month. Joan's parents still provide room and board, but she has to take care of her tuition, books, and other expenses. I can't afford to give, says Joan. I'm barely making it now. If I gave a tithe, it would be $80 a month, and I'd probably have to drop out of school. I'd like to give, but I just can't. The problem? Joan is not only robbing God. She's robbing herself of the opportunity to grow in faith. Right now, she doesn't believe God's promises in Malachi 3 or Matthew 6.33 or Luke 6.38 that he'll take care of her if she puts God first by giving him what's his. If God is capable of helping her get by on $800 a month, isn't he also capable of helping her get by on $720 a month? Jones' God doesn't seem very big. He can't even compensate for an $80 shortfall. Last one, Don and Sue believe they aren't under law but grace and that tithing lends itself to a pharisaical letter of the law approach. They believe that God's law is written on our hearts and we should freely give without compulsion. They are proud of their mature and liberating belief in grace giving. The problem, last year Don and Sue's grace giving amounted to $30 a month, about one half of 1% of their income. While they laud grace and deplore the law, their actions suggest that grace is one-twentieth as effective as the law. The problem is not with grace, of course, but their belief that grace means God has lowered his standards and doesn't care how we live. Again, I, I want to be sensitive to the variety of circumstances represented around this room. At the same time, I want as pastor to lead you not for the sake of a bank account here, but for the sake of, of your individual walk with the Lord, for us as a community of faith, and ultimately for the spread of the gospel and the advancement of the glory of God around the world. I want, I want to call us to give extravagantly, to let, just what if, what if, among the members of our faith family, in line with all those who have gone before us in redemptive history, the tithe was simply a starting point. And what if those of us who are already there began to take steps to go far beyond that? I pray that God would take the wealth he has entrusted to us with the wisdom he has promised to give us and he would use us to make his worship known in Birmingham and to the ends of the earth.